Welcome to Sorting Myself Out. And today is the beginning of a series with Dr. Roger Strachan. Earning a PhD under the precepts of the scientist practitioner model, Dr. Strachan was educated in scientific psychology and applied counseling skills. Neurophysiology, genetics, and clinical counseling were and are his special interests. Having taught undergraduate and graduate courses in psychology and maintained a private practice in counseling for over 61 years, Roger has served students and clients in their process of self-discovery and personal growth, making choices to enhance their lives. Like so many great stories where the seeker meets the wise old man on their path towards wholeness. I met Dr. Strachan in a time where I needed insight, clarity, and personal understanding. And that grew into this beautiful, blooming mentoring relationship where he took me under his wing and showed me a whole world of psychology, philosophy, and human transformation that I never thought was possible. And after this whole long process of about four years of intensive mentoring, we are now going through and recording aspects of his life story and his learning process and his own theories as a way to share with the world what's been so uniquely transformative and helpful to hundreds of his students and clients. This will be the first part of this series where Dr. Strachan takes us through the origins of Self Soul Spirit and Center for Creative Choice. Self is the unique components that make us individuals, a combination between the genetics and the environment, the nature and the nurture. Soul is the life force that pulsates throughout your being, and spirit is the great mystery, the great unknown. This multi-part series will now start with the origins, part one. You can expect the origins part two shortly after, and then we will get into some deeper stories of his understanding of the self-soul spirit model, as well as his life story, and further we'll go in deeper into the theory and also we will be taking questions down the line. Please enjoy part one, The Origins, with Dr. Roger Strachan. It's just a pleasure to learn from you, and I'm so glad that you're here. Thank you. You've taught me advanced techniques in understanding psychology. You've taught me how to live a soul-directed life. Uh, we've gone through everything from philosophy to authenticity, and I've got my intellectual needs satisfied as well as my soul needs satisfied. So it's, it's been quite a, a wild ride and I, I always brag about you to everyone. And so I'm, I'm glad I can share you with the world. Thank you very much. I want to make one correction. I didn't teach you. You did the work. And that's the beauty of self soul spirit model is the beauty is I facilitate you doing your work. I facilitate you finding the aspects of your soul and the parts of you. So the beauty of this is that it's power with and not power over. And it's equal, equality. Um, a man I greatly admired uh, said if you meet, he wrote a book, if you meet the Buddha in the road, kill him. Mm. The idea being no one should be in a higher power and uh, that we're all equal. And uh, my model is Bully Nelson. I got a couple years on your baby. That's all. <laughs> and uh, so I like Sheldon Kopp, and he wrote other kinds of things. But he w saw himself uh, as a pilgrim walking alongside. And um, so we're going to be talking about the origins, and we're going to be talking about the base structures that got created and then have metamorphized and changed and become um, and do some differentiation and then how very directly my partner and I, Larry Edkin, put together Center for Creative Choice. Mm -hmm. And then I put together Wilderness Encounter. <coughs> and the basis underneath Center for Creative Choice is the self-soul-spirit model which we'll be directing our attention to. And it was created in lieu of waiting for the genome. Right. So in 73 is when I started on this model. And in 2003, how ironic the, the timing there, is the beginning of the genome. Yes, when and they the first research, mapped it. Yes, the research on the 
genome since then. So one of the most interesting things that I've learned so far in this amazing journey that we're on is the, it, just the super focused ability that you have to read into somebody's subpersonalities. And I've just been amazed because you've walked me through, like last night we watched a movie and you helped me pause it every time there was a new subpersonality coming online. Right. Or the way that you can read body language and right. see people shifting from one mode right. of being to right. another. Right. Or if I have a life issue in relationships, right. how you're able just through hearing the story to right. kind of analyze the situation right. and the different parts at play. Right. That, these are all things that, this is the legacy of Center for Creative Choice and Self yes. Soul Spirit, the, the ability to understand human beings yes. and to learn how to move into soul-directed living. Right. So it starts with awareness and it moves into what to do with that awareness. And it's just been a beautiful journey. Thank you. I would love to take uh, credit for it because of learning and because of uh, experience. But the truth of the matter is, that's a natural phenomena that it is genetic. Therapists are born, not made. And uh, the later, perceptive ability. Yes, and some of the knowing that those are genetic uh, inheritance. So what happens is, when you go to school then, and when you live life experiences, and when you pay attention with this natural ability that you have, and when you uh, differentiate those skills are naturally there and you enhance them, you build upon them. Right. So what you have in my case, which I really appreciate your awareness of and the uh, appreciation about your recognizing those talents, is that some I came into the world with. Yes. And then they got built upon. Yeah, just like you're helping me build on exactly. skills. Exactly. I've got the best stories of us dealing with a life situation or a relationship situation, and you saying, this is what they're going to do next, and then they do it. Right. So it just proves that whatever you're reading into is valid. Yes. Because you're saying, these are the parts and the, how they're working. Now this is what this person's going to say next. Right. And it's amazing. And you think, you know, you, you think it's just something, by now you'd be like, oh, yeah, that's just what Roger does. But I still am amazed every single time. I told my girlfriend, Victoria, about your, your ability a while ago. And she said, well, maybe he's just really good at cold reading. And this was before you had met Victoria. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, it's not just cold reading. It's something else because uh, he doesn't even need to see the person's face every time to, to pick up on the... But it does help. It does help? That's why I do not like to do any kind of therapeutic work on Zoom. I'll do it as a temporary or in-between phenomena. But you also get intuitions combined with your psychological yes, but I, reading. But, but for me, I need the person in front of me. Then all those skills come to play. <coughs> That's why I don't like coaching on the phone. Yeah, but you still do it. You still not I do it, you're but still it's successful. not my best work. It's your best is when you're in person. Yes. Well, that's what Gestalt is really made you for. You got it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, being a teacher for 10 years uh, in the Sages, which is another outfit we're going to be talking about. So from 1987 to 1997, we had an active training school in Gestalt in Durango, Colorado, the Southwest Association of Gestalt and Expressive Studies. Now, we're setting this up on a here and now, moment to moment. Therefore, there is no A follows B. All the structural kind of things will be in other podcasts that take it. But this is going to be alive and well and moment to moment. And we have no idea if something comes up that we'll switch to that. Yes. We have no uh, legions to hold to a script. Yes. We've chosen to do that because that's exactly the way uh, the universe works. The universe is in the moment. And our great teachers have taught us that. And uh, they have brought us that, which is very scary. But the universe is in the moment. And the universe doesn't ask anybody's permission to deviate from the moment-to-moment -moment thing it decides to do. Mm -hmm. What we've learned that we can count on is change, which is something that is an oxymoron, you know, to say change is, is predictable. <laughs> yeah. But the beauty of it is, is that 
the universe strives for functionality and over time as we've developed genetically uh, we are doing the same okay structures help us to know a sense of safety and predictability and um, a perfect example is when we did research with people and took away their senses like in a John Lilly tank or uh, when we put them in suspended animation so to speak uh, in, in regards to the senses uh, people have trouble with that um, they have trouble the sensory uh, deprivation no, they have trouble because they're used to holding, touching, speaking, hearing, right. feeling, etc. Yeah, that, those tanks are crazy. I've those been tanks in... free you to be in the universe. Yes. And the tanks are the most like what the universe is anyway, right. in the sense that we're free floating. I'm going to start with that premise that uh, starts with the origins. First of all, everything that has a body <coughs> is unique. Not even identical twins are the same in humans. And, and there are no identical butterflies or snowflakes. So everything that has a boundary in a body is unique. And everything is connected. There's no space. Those are the basic principles that we have to start with. And those are the principles for the origin uh, that I'm going to be going right into. The other uh, factor is there only is attraction and connection. You cannot be influenced unless you can be influenced. Therefore, if you're attracted to something and you then connect with it, it's because the attraction was there. Not that that person can automatically or that situation can influence you. There's no such thing as power over. There's, there is power over. But the power over is in a physical sense. Not in a personality sense. Not in a energetic sense. I understand. Okay. If someone puts handcuffs on you, they have power over you. Right. Or, if someone or, shoots you between them and that gun, they have power over you. You're dead. Okay? Right. Now, let's go to the origins based on those phenomena. And one last, there's only positive energy. There's only proactive positive energy. There is no such thing as resistance. What we see as resistance is actually a positive energy pushback. Right. So here comes water, here's the wall, it hits the wall, it starts to tide back, but that's what it is. It's, it's a proactive energy pushing it back. Yeah. It's not resisting. And that's been validated. Over and over again. Yeah. Okay. So therefore, our actions... They're proactive. The human being is the only species that does exactly what it wants to do at any given moment and then makes up stories. So as we evolved, we have created stories and traditions and cultural values and so forth. There are no universal values according to the way humans look at them. Okay? Mm -hmm. Which means the universe then strives for functionality. Mm -hmm. So there we are. Everything is connected because there's no space. The Buddhists are correct. Everything is unique that has a body. Everything is directed by positive, pro-facilitating pro activity, okay? And we operate under the basis of attraction and connection. Therefore, we don't assimilate, we accommodate. When something comes to us, it comes to us, and then we accommodate it. So nothing comes into our system that isn't filtered, and that starts right at the beginning of conception. Wow. Isn't that amazing? So the only reason that I'm open to you as a teacher is because I have a part of me that's attracted to your teaching. You got it. Wow. And whatever's transpired in your life. So we come in with these genetic 
predisposition, life meets those, pushes against, the stronger the genetics in whatever realm, creativity, whatever, artistic, intelligence, there's a lot of different things, the more it pushes against life, the lesser the quality and value in terms of functionality of the genetics, the more life pushes against us. If you have an IQ of 200, you will act on your society, on your uh, activities of interactions with relationships. If you have an IQ of 70, we will direct you more. Society? Society. Well, many people with an IQ of 70 are actually incarcerated <coughs> in some form of of center or taken care of by their parents. Okay? Autistic children seldom reach individuality enough to care for themselves. Some do. Depends on the level. Okay? Wow. So there's all kinds of things. So so some some people come in with more tenacity and different abilities and so forth. If you come in missing body parts, we're going to be carrying you around until we can develop prosthetics. Yep. It doesn't mean that you may not have interest in that, okay? Or that you don't have a proclivity to do that, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So now let's begin with the origins. <clears throat> As we think of the fields of psychology and psychiatry and we think of our interactions it really begins at the turn of the century of the 1900s, and now we're in the new century. So in the late 1800s, this began to be a phenomena of our personalities, our beings, our essence as being determined. In 1859, Darwin came up with evolutionary theories. Mm -hmm. He went back to England and they were accepted for the animals because then the Church of England believed that a God came approximately 5,000 years ago and created humanoids. So the human development was different. Well, now we know we are simply, we came from the apes. We evolved from the monkeys, the apes, and that group. Now, there's the roots, there are the beginnings. When Freud came on the scene, he had a choice. He could go with genetics, that's what we call it now, or evolution, or he could have gone with philosophical foundations. He chose the John Lockean Tabla Rosa. You are a blank slate and life writes of end. You are no more than the sum total of your life experiences. He chose that model as the base even though he was instructed by people around him to really consider biological basis, mm -hmm. okay? He did get into some neurology, and then, Cho and then Freud developed a structure. Ego, superego, and id. The id are the driving basic forces. The superego has to do with value and conscience, and this has to do with management. We still use the term ego and management, but we misuse it. We now see ego as negative. You have too much ego or too little ego. We attach value. For Freud, it was only the manager. Okay? The id. I'm hungry. The superego. Well, you can't steal food. The manager. I'll grow it. I'll go to the grocery store and buy it. Now, let's jump all the way to the 1950s. Okay. In the 1950s, all of us are beginning to build on the Freud and the Youngs and the um, Adlers and the other people who, who developed directly under those people, okay? Mm -hmm. And then we get involved with Carl Rogers and Fritz Perls and others who came into dynamics, um, <coughs> psychosynthesis. Now, the 50s get stirred by the fact that after the Second World War, we're releasing 
all of his people back into life. And so we're going to recreate. The Second World War left us with, now what do we do? So we created manufacturing, and we, we turned the uh, factories that were dealing with uh, tanks to building cars, and the factories that were being for f planes that were uh, for military, into commercial, on and on and on. Mm. Those are the examples. And from that, we started building, okay? And in the process, we started looking at, well, what do we want to be? Mm -hmm. Where do we work? How do we survive? How do we build families? Immediately we went from more extended families to the, the uh, nuclear family. With the nuclear family we built suburbs and we built our cities and people occupying their own home. Whereas prior to that, the extended family, many f family units lived in the same compound, so to speak. Mm. Like on a farm. Mm -hmm. Okay? Wow. So often, you, you, if you left the farm, you left to uh, join another farm. If you're a woman, you married another farmer. And I'll give that example. And then you went, the woman went to live in uh, where the, uh, the matriarch, uh, I mean the patriarch, uh, rather than the matriarch. Mm -hmm. Okay? And as you think about before that, we had tribes. And the tribe all lived together. And then they broke up into mutual smaller tribes as they moved, moved on from there. Classic example, uh, going back uh, to when the um, indigenous people that became here, our Native Americans as so-called, uh, coming across the Bering Strait in the migrations, we'll take one group the Navajos and the Apaches. They were all one, but the Apaches were more of the fighting elements of the, and the Braves and the ones who did war, and then the Navajos were more of the farmers. The Navajos stayed in New Me what's now New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, and the Apaches went on to uh, areas of New Mexico and then into the Chiricahuas, okay? And they developed their kinds of societies. After the Second World War, we're creating a brand new, non-warring society. We have to bring back what we started with. And we brought back the Industrial Revolution, and then our societies built out of that. It was a perfect time for psychology then to begin to work with people. How do you raise families? How do you live in marriage? How do you live as a nuclear family? How do you live in terms of careers? And so we begin in our careers at the, right after the Second World War, the cradle to grave, okay? You got a job, you got the gold watch, you died. We even set up our actuarials around that at 65. So Social Security, when, when uh, got created under Roosevelt, then you're only gonna live about six months and now we're facing with Social Security will run out of money because we're living longer and longer. And the same with health insurance. And look where we are right now and we're recreating again. Should we actually have national health insurance? All these kinds of phenomena are grist for the mill for sociology and psychology. So when I come on the scene, I'm dealing with the theories of Carl Rogers, I'm dealing with the theories of Fritz Perls. I'm dealing with the theories of behavior modification, B.F. Skinner. I'm dealing with the theories that come out of uh, family systems and so forth. I opted for Fritz Perls and the model of here and now. You don't deal with past unless this is affecting the present. So you start in the present moment. That developed then <clears throat> into what my partner and I put together in 1973, Center for Creative Choice. It doesn't mean we didn't bring some of the things from Carl Rogers and some of the things from other therapists, 
But eventually, as we develop this model, and then self, soul, spirit that I developed, and then even wilderness counter, it's based on the here and now. It's based on the premise that there is no other moment but now. Okay? And the choices you make, you make for today. Tomorrow, you make all new choices. So one of the things that began to be broken into were traditions, rules, regulations, yeah, religions were challenged, okay? So in the 1950s, it was a huge challenge, for example, to the Catholic Church. And even though there had been many other so-called Protestant groups and other takeoffs, the idea that there would be an overall ruling began to lose meaning. Simple one. Contraceptives. <laughs> uh, having to go to a priest to get uh, your confession instead of going straight to God. So people begin to go straight to the God of their choosing. Okay? Which then leads to the individuality and so the idea is there are many gods as there are people. Because each person has their own set of perceptions. As those rules begin to break down, we begin to get more and more creative. Creative in the way we're going to live. Okay? From that came many new books. But the books still were based on structures. They were based on old models the models of developmental tabla rosa. Blank slate. The blank slate. Whereas we then begin to see no. And so in the early 1900s, we begin to really introduce idea of genetics. We begin to breed that way. Dogs, horses, plants. Then we start thinking of humans. So even at the Second World War, Hitler was already in use of genetics, where he was going to create a master race. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you only may stay within that. Others had already begun practices like that. Muslims should marry Muslims. Jews should marry Jews. Chinese should marry Chinese. But we're beginning to break that down because we began, in, in the Second World War, we started with universals. Okay? What do you mean? Okay, uh, white soldiers came home with Japanese wives. Okay. I see. Yeah, so it was intermingling. So even though we had had that of the Japanese moving here, the Japanese stayed within their cultures. I grew up around Gardena, California. Japanese married Japanese. Mm -hmm. Today that's not true. Okay. Mm. So... The same thing happened in Vietnam and happened in Korea, okay? Uh, Tiger Woods is from a black man and an Asian woman. Mm. On and on and on it goes. So now we're dispersing and, and creating wider genetic pools. Many of us then, at the 1950s, the origins for my soul self, self, soul spirit, and wilderness counter started on the basics of genetics. In one of our earlier podcasts, I mentioned to you that it started for me as early as eight years old. And it's the story of the sow that was mean and wouldn't let me handle her piglets. And even then I broke my uncle's uh, admonition and went in and played with the piglet, and here comes this mean sow. And I barely get through the fence, and my little eight-year-old body shuddered <laughs> at the relief of survival. Okay? And my uncle came around the corner, said, I told you not to go in that sow. And he said, that's it. That sow is going to be dinner on the table. We're going to chop up the rest of it and give it to our neighbors. They'll give us back when they slaughter some other animal. But I have another sow that will allow you to play with their piglets. 
I'm just using that style from here on in and probably her offspring. We really began to breed according to what we saw genetically. Temperament. Temperament, corn, you name it. Okay? And we tried to get certain kinds of... Now, that wasn't the first of that. Obviously, the Navos have been messing around with corns for a long time. Okay? And we have their seeds to this day as they... We did it with flowers. We did everything. But our interest is what made the difference. I, at eight years old, got mean sow, sweet sow. Oh, they're not automatically all the same. So then we began to look at that. A current example is when we began to have pit bulls fight in arenas. So we called out the sweet ones kept only the aggressive ones. Then we bred the aggressive ones with aggressive ones. Now, here's where we're lost. Here's where we are today. Yeah. Most dog pounds are filled with pit bulls or pit bull derivatives. Yes, people still like to think that these natural phenomena don't apply to humans somehow. Yes. Oh, but oh, pit bulls can inherit, inherit anger, but not, not people. Yes, not people, people. If people are angry, it's all societal conditioning. Right. But if pit bulls are angry, it's because they've been bred that way. Right. So why do we pick and choose? Oh, I can't answer that. Can you? No. no. What do you think? Do you have any suspicions? I have a lot of suspicions because of belief systems, because we're, we have trouble living with I don't know or let's see what happens. We have trouble living spontaneously. We like things to be predictable. We like things, and when they're not predictable, it literally drives us a little wacko. So, let's go back. Carl, uh, Carl Rogers tried to see if he could just bring enough awareness, you would make the change automatically. At the end of his career, and then the study of the person in La Jolla changed that. You have to get them to actually do it. Awareness is not enough. Behavioral activity has to follow. The behavior modification people jumped on that. And so they set up a series of stimulus, response, reward, thinking they could make it that mechanical. Okay? But it wasn't, and it still isn't. I was a lab scientist as well. I had that, but I kept myself honest. I had a cartoon in my lab, and it's a rat talking to another rat in a Skinner, back, Skinner box. And the one rat says to the other rat, you know, I got this Dr. Strachan trained. All I have to do is push this lever, and I get all the food. I don't have to hunt anymore. As a matter of fact, he even brings in another rat for me to make love to. How good is that? I don't have to do anything. So who's training who? So who's training who? Yeah. And that comes back to your theory of accommodation rather than assimilation. Yes. yes. So everything's proactive, nothing's reactive. Exactly. Fritz Perls adopted the existential and Buddhist sense of being in the here and now. And um, along with his uh, wife, uh, and um, they created the initial, then they got students, and uh, I was privileged to study under many of the first generation students. Why did I like that model? Because it seemed to fit reality that I knew, the way I projected things. I like to live in the here and now. I, did, I like spontaneity. Uh, I had a seeker, uh, and I see you have one too. I had a seeker that went over the hill just to see what's on the other side. So I was constantly in that notion of seeking. I did not like sedentary. I liked activity. So my genetic predispositions led into Gestalt. Okay? There's the attraction connection. Can you give a, just a brief definition of Gestalt for people? Yeah. Gestalt therapy is different than Gestalt theory. 
Okay? But it grew Gestalt out of it. Gestalt theory is based upon a phenomena that the sum of the parts is greater than those sum. Than the whole? Then the whole of the Gestalt is greater than the sum of the parts. Which means that there is a larger continuity, a larger essence, a larger phenomena. But these subparts contribute to that, but there is that sense that it becomes greater than just the sum of the parts. Okay? That's Gasalt theory. And it's based upon a, a, con a concept of they were created in Germany. Gestalt therapy is based upon you work with the parts to get to that aha gestalt total entity so that the sum of your work will bring about a gestalt, a total understanding, a greater meaning. Okay? From that, uh, in the gestalt, why we had the chair and we had top dog, underdog, I brought into that all the parts, okay? And then when I get to Willis and Connell, I'll explain that. So here are the exact origins. <clears throat> I'm trained in Gestalt, so is my buddy. And by the way, he went on to study under Milton Erickson and used eventually in his own practice, Milton Erickson, and I stayed more with Gestalt. Okay? Milton Erickson includes a lot of hypnosis and uh, loses, uh, uses uh, where you uh, actually get uh, sent things set up in a conflictual kind of way, so like over-exaggeration, okay? Now, and paradoxical, Gestalt stays with just exactly what you are, and it often begins with the beginning point is what are you aware of right now? So let's try, for example. What are you aware of right now? Aware there's a pressure in my head. I'm aware that my feet are touching the ground. Aware I have a percolating energy in my chest. I'm aware of a sense of Enjoyment and listening. Now we're going to the next step in Gestalt. Tell me about the percolating in your chest. Tell me more about that. Be the, be the actual percolating. Close your eyes and percolate. I'm just moving around. I feel a hot energy. I feel an agility. I feel an adaptability. I feel uh, a tension. Put the same words in your feet and move them a little more. That's right. it. Yeah. yeah. What does that dancing Agility, feel like? Ability, Agility, attention. Like I'm ready to go. I'm ready to roll. I'm ready what to make things happen. What are you ready to go to? Um, ready to make things happen. I'm ready to produce. I'm ready to evolve. I'm ready to put this podcast out. I'm ready to show everyone what we're doing. Outstanding. I'm I could stop I, there. I, I, <laughs> Good. Now, and it keeps on building. Yeah. Now, the advantage of that is you start in the moment and then you build whatever work would develop out of that. It just evolves. And it evolves. And then I would get into the parts of you talking about the building of the podcast and where you're going with it and so forth. Because okay? right. that's present in the moment where you are. <clears throat> now, let me show you the difference between that and strict behavior modification. Okay. Okay. A student of mine was taking for her master's a behavior modification course, dialectical, and they were watching a tape. And the tape was 10 sessions based upon goal setting and then a series of, of ways of reaching that goal. Okay. Okay. We're in the ninth session. And the woman involved as the client, for whatever reason, had not shared some really valuable information. And the assignment was 
to be working on self-worth. And the very aspect of working on the self-worth triggered this. So she said to the therapist, there's something I have to tell you. I'm in a very abusive relationship. And it's just, it's just, it's out, of, it's out of limits. It's going crazy and on and on. She goes on a little bit more. Here's what he does. Well, okay. Now let's go back to your assignment from the last session on the steps you were taking for self-worth. That's it? That's it. My student blew up right there in the class. I said, are you aware of what's happening? This guy's more attached to the goals that were being set and the objectives to reach him and the work that was being done and missed how traumatized this woman is. Wow. When you're in the moment, you go to right to work. You just work with what's there. You work with what's there. You let go of the agenda a little bit. Exactly. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Dr. Roger Strachan on Sorting Myself Out. Hit that notification bell and subscribe to stay tuned for what's coming up next with Dr. Roger Strachan, as well as other transformational content right here on Sorting Myself Out. If you have any questions, you can email sortingmyselfout0 at gmail.com. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we really appreciate all the support.